150 years ago, the business corporation was a relatively insignificant institution. Today, it is all pervasive, like the church, the monarchy, and the Communist Party in other times and places, the corporation is today's dominant institution. This documentary examines the nature, evolution, impacts, and possible futures of the modern business corporation. Initially given a narrow legal mandate, what has allowed today's corporation to achieve such extraordinary power and influence over our lives? We begin our inquiry as scandals threaten to trigger a wide debate about the lack of public control over big corporations. So I don't think there is um, an overhang uh, over the market of distrust. Listen, 95% or some percent, huge percentage of the business community are honest and uh, reveal all their assets. And got compensation programs that are balanced, and, uh, but there are some bad actors. The media debate about the basic operating principles of the corporate world was quickly reduced to a game of follow the leader. I still happen to think the United States is the greatest place in the world to invest. We have some shakeups that are going on because of a few bad apples. Some people call me a bad apple. Well, I may be bruised, but I still taste sweet. the sweetest apple on the tree. These are not just a bunch of bad apples. This is just a few bad apples. It's not just a few bad apples. We've got to get rid of the bad apples. You can start with Tyco. Bad apples. We know all about WorldCom. Bad apples. Xerox Corporation. Bad apples. Arthur Anderson. Bad apples. Enron, obviously. Bad apples. Kmart Corporation. The fruit cart is getting uh, a little more full. I don't think it's just a few apples, unfortunately. I think this is the worst crisis of confidence in uh, business. What's wrong with this picture? Can't we pick a better metaphor to describe the dominant institution of our time? Through the voices of CEOs, whistleblowers, brokers, gurus and spies, insiders and outsiders, we present the corporation as a paradox, an institution that creates great wealth but causes enormous and often hidden harms. I see the corporation as part of a jigsaw in society as a whole, which if you remove it, the picture's incomplete. But equally, if it's the only part, it's not going to work. A sports team. Some of us are blocking and tackling, some of us are running the ball, some of us are throwing the ball, but we all have a common purpose, which is to succeed as an organization. A corporation is like a family unit. People in a corporation work together for a common end. Like the telephone system, it reaches almost everywhere. It's extraordinarily powerful. It's pretty hard to avoid. And it transforms the lives of people, I think, on balance for the better. The eagle, soaring, clear-eyed, competitive, prepared to strike, but not a vulture. Noble, uh, visionary, majestic, that people can believe in and be inspired by, that creates such a lift that it soars. I could see that being a good logo for the principal company. <laughs> well, okay, guys, enough bullshit. Corporations are artificial creations. You might say they're monsters trying to devour as much profit as possible uh, at anyone's expense. I think of a whale, gentle, big fish, which could swallow you in an instant. Dr. Frankenstein's creation has overwhelmed and overpowered him as the corporate form has done with us. The 
word corporate gets attached in in almost you know in a pejorative sense to and gets married with the word agenda and one hears a lot about the corporate agenda as though it is evil as though it is an agenda which is trying to take over the world personally i don't use the word corporation i use the word business i will use the word use the word uh, uh, company, I'll use the words business community. Because I think that is a much fairer representation than zeroing in on just this word corporation. What is a corporation? It's funny that I've taught in a business school for as long as I have without ever having been asked uh, so, so pointedly to say what I think a corporation is. It is one form of business ownership. It's a group of individuals working together to serve a variety of objectives, the principal one of which is earning large, growing, sustained, legal returns for the people who own the business. The modern corporation has grown out of the industrial age. The industrial age began in 1712 when an Englishman named Thomas Newcomen invented a steam-driven pump to pump water out of the English coal mines so the English coal miners could get it more coal to mine rather than hauling buckets of water out of the mine. It was all about productivity, more coal per man hour. That was the dawn of the industrial age. And then it became more steel per man hour, more textiles per man hour, more automobiles per man hour. And today, it's more chips per man hour, more gizmos per man hour. The system is basically the same, producing more sophisticated products today. The dominant role of corporations in uh, our lives is essentially a product of the roughly the past century. Corporations were originally associations of people who were chartered by a state to perform some particular function, like a group of people want to build a bridge over the Charles River or something like that. There were very few chartered corporations in early United States history. And the ones that existed had clear stipulations in their state-issued charters how long they could operate, the amount of capitalization, uh, what they made or did or maintained a turnpike, whatever, was in their charter, and they didn't do anything else. They didn't own or couldn't own another corporation. Uh, their shareholders were liable, and so on. In both law and the culture, the corporation was considered a subordinate entity that was a gift from the people in order to serve the public good. So you have that history, and we shouldn't be misled by it. It's not as if those were the halcyon days when all corporations served the public trust. But there's a lot to learn from that. The Civil War and the Industrial Revolution created an enormous growth in corporations. And so there was an explosion of railroads who got large federal subsidies of land, banking, heavy manufacturing, and corporate lawyers a century and a half ago realized they needed more power to operate and wanted to remove some of the constraints that had historically been placed on the corporate form. The 14th Amendment was passed at the end of the Civil War to give equal rights to black people. And therefore, it, it said no state can deprive any person of life, liberty, or property without due process of law. And that was intended to prevent the states from taking away life, liberty, or property from black people, as they had done uh, for so much of our history. And what happens is the corporations come into court, and corporation lawyers are very clever, and they say, oh, you can't deprive a person of life, liberty, or property. We are a person. A corporation is a person. And the Supreme Court goes along with that. And what was particularly grotesque about this was that the 14th Amendment was passed to protect newly freed slaves. 
So, for instance, between uh, 1890 and 1910, there were 307 cases brought before the court under the 14th Amendment. 288 of these brought by corporations, 19 by African Americans. Six hundred thousand people were killed to get rights for people. And then with strokes of the pen over the next 30 years, judges applied those rights to capital and property while stripping them from people. Everybody makes a mistake once in a while, but I just can't be personally responsible that's one of the weaknesses of a partnership, isn't it, Sid? Well, maybe you'd better incorporate the store. Incorporate? Yes. Incorporating would give you the big advantage of what you want right now. Limited liability. You start with a group of people who want to invest their money in a company. Then these people apply for a charter as a corporation. This government issues a charter to that corporation. Now that corporation operates legally as an individual person. It is not a group of people. It is under the law, a legal person. Imperial Steel Incorporated is many of the legal rights of a person. It can buy and sell property. It can borrow money. It can sue in court and be sued. It carries on a business. Imperial Steel, along with thousands of other legal persons, is a part of our daily living. It is a member of our society. Having acquired the legal rights and protections of a person, the question arises, what kind of person is the corporation? Corporations were given the rights of immortal persons, but then special kinds of persons, persons who have no moral conscience. These are special kind of persons which are designed and by law to be concerned only for their stockholders and not say what are sometimes called their stakeholders, like the community or the workforce or whatever. The great problem of having corporate citizens is that they aren't like the rest of us. As Baron Thurlow in England is supposed to have said, they have no soul to save and they have no body to incarcerate. I believe the mistake that a lot of people make when they think about corporations is they, th they think, you know, corporations are like us. General Electric is a kind old man with lots of stories. Nike. Young. Energetic. Microsoft. Aggressive. McDonald's. Young, outgoing, uh, enthusiastic. Monsanto. Immaculately dressed. Disney. Goofy. The body shop. Uh, deceptive. Very lovely. <laughs> Do you know what the body shop is? Nope. <laughs> they think they have feelings, they have politics, they have belief systems. They really only have one thing, the bottom line. How to make as much money as they can in any given quarter. That's it. Of course they make a profit. And it's a good thing. That's the incentive that makes capitalism work to give us more of the things that we need. That's the incentive that other economic systems lack. People accuse us of only paying attention to the, the economic lag because they think that's what a business person's mindset is. It's just money. And it's not so because we as business people know that we need to certainly address the environment, but also we, we need to be seen as constructive members of, of society. There are companies that, that do good for the communities. They, they produce services and goods that are of value to all of us that make our lives better, and that's a good thing. The problem comes in, in the profit motivation here, because these people, there's no such thing as enough. And I always counter point out, there's no organization on this planet that can neglect its economic foundation. Even someone 
you know, living under a banyan tree is dependent on, on support from someone. The economic lag has to be addressed by everyone. It's not just a business issue. But unlike someone under a banyan tree, all publicly traded corporations have been structured through a series of legal decisions to have a peculiar and disturbing characteristic. They are required by law to place the financial interests of their owners above competing interests. In fact, the corporation is legally bound to put its bottom line ahead of everything else, even the public good. That's not a law of nature. That's a very specific decision, in fact, a judicial decision. Uh, so they're concerned only for the short-term profit of their stockholders who are very highly concentrated. To whom do these companies owe um, loyalty? What does loyalty mean? Well, it, it turns out that that was a rather naive concept anyway, as corporations are always owed obligation to themselves to get large and to get profitable. In doing this, it tends to be more profitable to the extent it can make pe other people pay the bills for its impact on society. There's a terrible word that economists use for this called externalities. An externality is, a, is the effect of a transaction between two individuals on a third party who has not consented to or played any role in the carrying out of that transaction. And there are real problems in that area, there's no doubt about it. Running a business is a tough proposition. There are costs to be minimized at every turn. And at some point, the corporation says, you know, let somebody else deal with that. Let's let somebody else supply the military power to the Middle East to protect the oil at its source. Let's let somebody else build the roads that we can drive these automobiles on. Let's let somebody else have those problems. And that is where externalities come from, that notion of let somebody else deal with that. I got all I can handle myself. A corporation is an externalizing machine in the same way that a shark is a killing machine. Each one is designed in a very efficient way to accomplish particular objectives. In the achievement of those objectives, uh, there isn't any question of malevolence or of will. The enterprise has within it and the shark has within it those characteristics that enable it to do that for which it was designed. So the pressure's on the corporation to deliver results now and to externalize any cost that this unwary or uncaring public will allow it to externalize. <laughs> To determine the kind of personality that drives the corporation to behave like an externalizing machine, we can analyze it like a psychiatrist would a patient. We can even formulate a diagnosis on the basis of typical case histories of harm it has inflicted on others, selected from a universe of corporate activity. Well, this is the office of the National Labor Committee here in the garment area of New York City. It's a little bit uh, disheveled. These are all uh, from different campaigns. To make this stuff concrete as possible, we purchase all of the products from the, the factories that we're talking about. This shirt sells for $14.99, and the women who made the shirt got paid three cents. Liz Claiborne jackets made in El Salvador. The jackets are $178, and the workers were paid 74 cents for every jacket they made. Alpine cost stereos, 31 cents an hour. It's not just sneakers, it's not just apparel, it's, it's everything. We were in Honduras, and some workers, they knew the kind of work we did, and they approached us, these young workers, and they said, uh, Conditions in our factory are horrible. Will you please meet with us? 
And we said we would, but you can't meet in the developing world. You can't walk up to a factory with your notebook and workers come out, interview them. I mean, there's goons, there's spies, the military police. So you do everything in a clandestine manner. We're about to start the meeting, and in walk three guys, very tough looking guys. The company had found out about our meeting and sent these spies. Obviously, uh, we didn't have the meeting. But these young girls were really bright. And as they were leaving, away from the eyesight of the spies, they started to put their hands underneath the table. And I put my palm under there, put my hand under there, and they put into my, my hand their pay stubs. So we'd know who they were, what they were paid, and the labels that they made in the factory so we'd know who they worked for. And I took my hand out after everyone had left, and then the palm of my hand was the face of Kathy Lee Gifford. But the bottom of it is the, the interesting part. A portion of the proceeds from the sale of this garment will be donated to various children's charities. It's very touching. Get your right here. Walmart is telling you if you purchase these pants, and Kathy Lee is telling you, you purchase these pants, you're going to help children. The problem was the people who handed us the label were 13 years of age. Do many people have family work? Just me. You support. How many people do you support? Eight people. Eight people. Yeah. And how do you do with that salary? Is it enough? Let's look at it from a, a different point of view. Let's look at it from the point of view of the the uh, people in Bangladesh who are starving to death, the people in China who are starving to death. And the only thing that they have to offer to anybody that is worth anything is their low-cost labor. And in effect, what they are saying to the world is they have this big flag that says, come over and hire us. We will work for 10 cents an hour because 10 cents an hour will buy us the rice that we need not to starve. And come and rescue us from our circumstance. And so when Nike comes in, they are regarded by everybody in the community as an enormous godsend. The door was wide open. That's my clothes. Those are my clothes. This is not your clothes. Where's your camera? Let's look. Don't touch the woman. Okay, why? Okay. This is a private company. Yes. Without permission, how can you come in? Uh -huh. huh. Well, the door was wide open, and uh, the door is wide open. You throw the employees, not for you. <laughs> we went through the garbage dump in the Dominican Republic. We always do this kind of stuff. We dig around. One day, we found a big pile of Nike's internal pricing documents. Nike assigns a time frame to each operation. They don't talk about minutes. They break the time frame into ten thousandths of a second. You get to the bottom of all 22 operations to give the workers 6.6 .6 minutes to make the shirt. It's 70 cents an hour in the Dominican Republic. That 6.6 .6 minutes equals 8 cents. These are Nike's documents. That means the wages come to 3 tenths of 1% of the retail price. This is the reality. It's the science of exploitation. What happens in the areas where these corporations go in and are successful? They soon find that they can't do any more in that country because the wages are too high now. And what's that another way of saying? Well, the people are no longer desperate. So, OK, we've used up all the desperate people there. They're all plump and healthy and wealthy. Let's move on to the next desperate lot and employ them and raise their level up. Well, the whole idea of the export processing zone is that it will be the first step towards this wonderful new development. Through the investment that's attracted to these countries, there will be a trickle-down effect into the communities. But because so many countries are now in the game of creating these free trade enclaves, they have to keep providing more and more incentives for companies to come to their little denationalized pocket. Um, and the, the, the tax holidays get longer. So the workers rarely make enough money to buy three meals a day, let alone feed their local economy 